Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Teresa Lawler, VP of Marketing at Cloud Elements. We're going to get started with a webinar in just a few minutes, but I'd like to give everyone some extra time to get dialed in. If you're having trouble, please follow the directions on the screen, and we'll talk to you in just a few. All right, I see a few more people coming on in, but um, let's get going. Uh, well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be in the world today. I hope you are all safe and healthy during this very challenging time. Um, welcome to our 2020 edition of the State of API Integration Report Webinar. This is our fourth year um, that we've been publishing the report here at Cloud Elements. And um, today we'll be presenting a short webinar um, where we'll discuss the key findings from the report in depth um, and with the report contributors. But first we'll take care of some housekeeping items. Um, please do go ahead and submit questions into the GoToWebinar console. We'll be monitoring that and we'll hold questions until the end of the webinar. The slides, the recording, and a copy of the full report will be shared with you after the webinar. Um, so let's get started. I'd like to introduce you to our MC today, Mark Genie, um, the CEO and co-founder of Cloud Elements. Uh, in founding Cloud Elements, Mark had a vision to extend API management beyond just the publishing and governance of APIs to the management of how we consume APIs. He founded the industry's first API integration platform to ease the burden he and his development team had experienced in making APIs work together at previous companies. Um, so, Mark, thanks for taking the time to host the webinar today, and I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Teresa. Appreciate the introduction, and uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us today. And again, just to reiterate, as Teresa mentioned, we, we really appreciate your time, and uh, we wish you uh, uh, safety and health uh, during these times. But I'm looking forward to our panel discussion today and really diving deeper into the findings from our fourth annual uh, report. Uh, we'll highlight some of the findings at the early part of this webinar, and then we're going to dive deeper into some key topics that surface from the report, including a review of data standards, event-driven APIs, and GraphQL. But first, let's uh, let's meet the rest of our uh, panel. And Ross, why don't we uh, start with you? Um, let's just go through and do some quick introductions. Absolutely. Thanks, Mark, um, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I lead the, the product organization here at Cloud Elements, and uh, I'm also the editor of uh, the State of API Integration Report. This is our, our fourth report, um, and I'm uh, always joined by other um, leading lights in the, in the world of APIs and integration. And so I'm uh, very happy to have Brian and Matthew um, joining us today on this uh, um, webinar. Um, maybe I'll pass it over to Brian. Thanks, Ross. This is uh, I'm Brian Bush. I lead product and alliances marketing for Cloud Elements at the moment. Um, I've held several sales and marketing roles for a number of startups in the Bay Area and in Colorado, um, and I'm particularly excited to be a part of this sort of primary research with Cloud Elements. A because it gets us out of some of the kind of the marketing speak. Uh, but it gives you some interesting insights into some of the respondents. So first, I want to say thank you for anybody who uh, who's listening, who attended. And uh, I saw one little quote going through some of the qualitative pieces where somebody was saying, hey, it's really important to integrate to dot, 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 Mickey Mouse. Oh, I'm sorry, my daughter distracted me. 
So I love some of those fun little insights into people's lives. <laughs> Matthew, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thanks for uh, thanks. For some... Well, firstly, thanks for thanks for having me on as a guest speaker. Um, it's great to uh, um, bring my viewpoint. Um, I mean, I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Ably. Um, we've been uh, delivering sort of real-time APIs for the last six years. Um, and uh, increasingly, we're um, uh, moving further back in the supply chain of how businesses exchange data in real time, sort of event-driven data um, APIs. So um, really excited to be part of this. And um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, we really uh, appreciate you all joining us today. And uh, we have a great panelist. Thank you for uh, your background. Well, before we get started into the report, the world has changed considerably since the uh, the last uh, survey responses uh, in the uh, end of February, early March. And uh, we'd really like to just uh, look at um, beyond the health impacts of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, how's this going to impact the state of our industry, right? The state of the world of APIs and digitization. Uh, as we know, the economies are, are going to adjust. They're going to change change as we forward and just like to hear from our panelists what your what your thoughts are here today and what some of the impacts could be as we look to the future yeah this is brian i'll go ahead and jump in because i was just recently uh on a conversation with a customer this happens to be a customer who's in kind of the e-commerce personalization world and uh i uh, was on with one of our account executives and and the ceo of the company was mentioning that they've already made some tactical um, cuts, frankly, they've, you know, become a little bit more conservative around where they're spending. Uh, but they also, you know, this is actually an AI company. They're using AI and big data to, to do some of that personalization. And he kind of mentioned having a choice between continuing to develop or really to launch really ambitious, new, interesting features around folks, their customers who are enterprises, inventory data, or looking at kind of what he described as very tactical, uh, highly visible um, automations. And so he actually hit on, hey, when we look at our customer onboarding process, um, there's a lot of time of our engineer staff that goes into onboarding new customers, getting the data in shape um, in order to get that customer to value. And so as he was kind of looking at through the downturn, should I invest in those big ambitious new things, or should I invest in kind of the very visible user facing automation focused pieces? He was, he was really focused on the latter, on the automation focus in an effort to one, keep the existing customers um, who he knows that will also be affected by, by the downturn, but also um, to get new customers to value faster. And so I thought that was an interesting uh, choice that it seems like leaders have to make between kind of the big, strategic efforts in this, in this time of a downturn versus some of the very clear user uh, user facing kind of smaller maybe pain points but that are highly visible to users absolutely um, Matt any uh, any additional thoughts yeah I mean I just yeah following on from that point I mean you're saying about you know people changing to the consumer focused um, features and, and and deliverables I mean that's that's exactly what we're seeing I mean we're seeing um, you know for our business actually an increase in the Demand. I think you know. I think the the what what what's driving that is that um, I suppose these these sort of more real time experiences that you know customers are expecting. I think it was it was seen as an enhancement, a, a benefit. Whereas now I think it's a necessity, right? This is the way you trade today. Um, you have to operate online and you have to deliver a great user experience. And I think that's driving a lot of um, it's driving businesses to move quickly and try and solve these problems. Um, I also think what we've seen is, is, is that the buying behaviors have changed. I think organizations have um, historically gone through quite long procurement processes to make these sorts of decisions about how they integrate APIs and um, buy in technology. And it's really forced their hand to kind of move quickly and make decisions. And I mean, I think it'll have a positive long term impact because um, they've had to, they've, they've, they've advanced technology forwards um, because they've had to do these things very quickly. Um, and let's hope it sort of has a has a, a positive impact from an API perspective um, moving forward. And Ross, 
<clears throat> yeah, I absolutely concur. I think, you know, one of the things that I've started to, to consider as, you know, the way we do work has changed significantly over the past three, four weeks. And um, with um, almost uh, everybody working from home as best uh, as best they can and trying to deal with some of the processes, business processes um, that exist today. Um, isn't that easy um, when we're now all in our own homes and trying to um, continue on business as, as, uh, as usual? Um, and one example of this, I think, uh, is quite clear in, uh, in the sort of accounts receivable department. Um, we still, in the B2B space, rely so heavily on uh, checks, as an example. Um, and so um, incoming payments, payments that businesses rely on every day, are still being sent via um, paper physical check. And, um, and this is a really challenging thing, thing to deal with, um, both uh, logistically and um, you know, with the sort of consideration of um, the health of our, of our team members. Um, so I think you know, if there's anything good that can potentially come of this crisis that we're all facing, Perhaps that we can start to really rethink some of these business processes, some of these legacy industries and legacy processes that um, still rely so heavily on old school um, uh, things like checks uh, will be forced to modernize and forced to digitize. Um, and I think that really plays very nicely into the core theme um, um, for this uh, report this year and for some of the discussion we're going to have amongst the panel as well. Yeah, it's interesting that this the theme of the report, right, this sticking this loyalty, this customer experience to be able to keep customers, improve that experience, optimize how we engage. Uh, it's really going to be on fast forward, right? There, If you look at this, uh, there was a quote recently by uh, Robert Kaplan, uh, managing director of the Eurasia Group. Uh, he mentioned at the Council of Foreign Relations Conference recently where he described it as history is now on fast forward. Right, and so um, obviously um, with great sensitivity to the health challenges that the world is facing, there is going to be an acceleration of things, uh, of the digitization of our world. And as economies start opening up, um, there will be new opportunities and changes as we uh, move forward to that. So thanks for those, uh, those perspective. And uh, let's, uh, let's now dive into the report and, and get back to that. So. Um, and so we had nearly 400 respondents this year representing 44 countries across the globe. The respondents range from developers to product leaders through to the C-suite. We also had a very even distribution between independent software vendors, so software companies and enterprises that are building applications and building platforms. And what's always interesting is this loaded word, right? This, the word platform, right? But we continue to see this growing trend uh, year over year for both enterprises and software companies that are viewing themselves as platform providers. And so, um, Brian, it'd be great to get some insight into what were people thinking in the report when they identify themselves as a, uh, as a platform provider? Yeah, um, so happy to. This one, I think, like a lot of things, the we don't put a definition on a term like this when we ask. Um, to some extent, I think we rely on something of a least common denominator definition, and I think of that as a platform uh, is something on which you build another product or service. Um, but you know, not to just rely on kind of that definition, we did dig into um, both some of the trend data around the question like this, as well as some of the qualitative pieces. Um, and so interestingly, I think from a trend perspective, we see going back to 2000, uh, 2018, 2019, and through this year in 2020, there's been a trend where more and more of our respondents are saying, or can they, they're answering yes to this question. They consider themselves a platform provider Specifically in 2018, it was 56% of the respondents. This year, as you can see, it's about 65. Um, secondly, digging into some of kind of the qualitative responses around this to try and get a little bit more color around what that term means to, to the folks who responded, I think what we saw is in the folks who responded yes, um, we saw a lot of comments around what I'll call kind of the challenges at scale. 
Um, we saw a lot of comments around, quote, saving IT costs, um, distributed API gateways, uh, and better documentation. We saw um, comments like standardized authentication flows uh, and no-code app development tools. And these were all in context of meeting the needs for, I think, many quantitatively many uh, integrations, whereas for the folks who responded no to this question, there were a lot more comments that seemed to fit into what felt like uh, a themes around innovation and agility. Uh, specifically, there were th comments like um, solutions agility, um, standard data models across applications uh, to limit the time uh, that's spent mapping and transforming data, um, comments around a need for more skilled employees and improved DevOps, specifically around the CI CD pipeline and tooling. Uh, and as we'll get to with Matthew a little later on, uh, for one comment said, quote, just more asynchronous or async integration that in parentheses scale well. Uh, so I think again, kind of that platform piece, we see folks kind of wrestling with the challenges of scale. Those who don't consider themselves platforms are talking a lot more about innovation and agility. Yeah, I mean, I, I must admit, I, I, I sort of, I think the word platform is is quite subjective, and obviously, uh, being sort of more as an infrastructure platform as a service provider, I, I know what I think of as a platform. I, I, I it'll be interesting, I think, to see, you know, the people who completed the survey and why they think it's a platform versus, you know, potentially the CEOs of those companies, and and maybe see APIs as a channel, but not, you know, not that's not the, their business is not a platform. It's just um. You know, one of one of their channels maybe allows them to act as a platform, but um, really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, interesting to see more and more enterprises even identifying as being a platform, right? Something that can be built upon, added to, um, becoming much more strategic. So, um, interesting trend. Uh, another one is uh, uh, this acceleration and the adoption of integration into platform offerings. And uh, Ross, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, you know, I think these two questions have kind of gone hand in hand um, uh, as we've uh, completed the survey over the past few years. Um, and, and really what we're getting at is, you know, what is it that you're doing as part of your product strategy in order to service the needs of your customers and partners in aid of becoming a platform. Um, and uh, for some, that's thinking about providing sort of uh, integration experiences inside your app, maybe offering a full scale integration platform yourself on iPads, it's, as it's often known. And um, maybe it's things for developers like SDKs so that you can more um, easily consume a wide variety of APIs. Um, and for others, then it can come down to um, you know, the basic building blocks, the workflows um, that uh, business users um, can lean on. So I, I think it's interesting to see this spread for sure. And that, you know, more and more organizations are are going towards the sort of the fully featured um, notion of, of integration and, and making that a core to their product offering. Um, and I think it also speaks to um, the the persona differences that we see from from the respondents here. So obviously the report sort of spans um, enterprises, ISVs, SIs, etc. Um, and and the types of personas they're serving um, is obviously very highly variable. Um, and I think that that shows up here in the data. Thank you. And then let's uh, let's shift into a tackle an even more broad term, uh, digital transformation, right? We uh, clearly digital transformation uh, initiatives are far and away the, uh, the you know, the driver for um, application integration and API integration. And um, what are your thoughts behind that, Brian? Yeah, and I, I say this fully aware that I'm in a marketing role, but I think we have to accept that the marketers have gotten their hands on, on the term digital transformation as much as the architects and the CIOs in the world. Um, and I, I feel like, yeah, indeed. Um, and you know, I do feel like digital transformation is the type of term uh, that is powerful because whomever you are or 
whomever kind of you're you're trying to use that term with folks can see their own problems and their own challenges kind of in that term it's it's all encompassing in that way um, and that's why again we dug into some of the the qualitative responses um, to try and understand this and you know for those who kind of see just four answers I'm sure you know from how we asked the question there could be other responses here uh, but you look at the qualitative data and I think two themes really came out. One was about, quote, better use cases. Um, that was from somebody more on, on the technology or the CIO or CTO office side of the house, if you will. Um, but looking at kind of similar responses is really speaking to a better understanding of what technology is supposed to do or what is the future business model that it's supposed to found and kind of hinting at still some lingering, I think, challenges around um, a disconnect, if you will, between what's the business process or outcome we're trying to, to achieve and how, from a technology standpoint, we might go about achieving that. Um, the second one, second theme, I think, that came out in the quality of responses from these respondents who said that uh, digital transformation is driving their need for app integration uh, were a lot of quotes around, frankly, the need for, quote, an integration platform and strategy. And I think what that speaks to is there, you know, underneath this term of digital transformation, a lot of folks are saying, we no longer want to deal with these needs one off. We no want, longer want to deal with them piecemeal. We no longer want the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing. We want more of a cohesive strategy, set of tools, approach to solving these problems, um, presumably across a larger organization or you know, between different business units, products lines, so on and so forth. So I think that's, those are kind of the themes that, that you know, a better understanding of the actual use cases and kind of a need for a strategy, those seem to be the key themes fitting under that digital transformation umbrella. Thanks, Brian. I think that's a, a good lead into our next sec section on the business of APIs. Uh, so we'll, we'll dive into more about how companies are looking at the ROI, right? How they look to achieve the ROI from this investment in APIs. And, uh, and also, this will give some insight as well into that digital transformation, right? What are they looking to get? Uh, the reasons for those digital transformation initiatives and the ROI they're expecting from that. And one of the key themes that we, uh, we saw in this report is this thematic trend to, that's driving these digital transformation initiatives, right? The connected experience for customers, uh, partners, and even employees, right? So, um, Brian, let's, uh, let's dig into this a bit deeper. Sure thing. Um, I think the place to start when we look at the business model, uh, the, sorry, the business of APIs is to really dig in and understand kind of some of the different business models that we see out in the world. Um, first and foremost, uh, we, when we ask some of these questions, like there are certainly business models around um, folks who provide either data or a service as an API call itself. Um, you can think of folks like Dun & Bradstreet um, who are a data provider. We can think of folks like PaySimple or Twilio who provide a service as an API. And often that, you know, they kind of meter that on a per API call basis. We're not really considering, you know, in, that, in a case like that or when we ask this sort of question, do folks charge for API access? we consider those cases the product or the service itself. So we're sort of excerpting that from, uh, from kind of the data set here. Um, as you can see, um, a number just under the, the majority of folks, 44%, um, now say they're charging for API access. And importantly, if you look at the trend data, which is not, uh, not in this slide, 56% of respondents last year said that they charged for API access. And I think that kind of speaks to the fact that, A, there are more APIs in the world every single day. Um, but I think if, if we read, you know, at the risk of reading too much between the lines, that 
just offering that API is no longer the differentiator that it once was. I think if the trend is moving down from charging just for access to that API, again, not that you know, the API is the expression of your product or service, but for charging to for access to your API or an API, if that's trending down, I think that means that that's becoming more of a competitive necessity, no longer a differentiator. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to see. That's the first time we've actually seen um, fewer companies charging for their API than not, right? And so that that's yep. uh, the first time we've really seen that tipping point in the in the market. So if uh, fewer companies are actually charging for their their API, um, what are what are some of the business models that we are seeing and how they're being applied? Yeah, I'll give a few examples. I think. First and foremost, um, we see a number of times where API or I'll say kind of very inclusively an integration experience, uh, which often denotes when, when a software company has productized some sort of self-serve integration, um, there are times where that either the API access or that integration experience is part of a higher subscription tier for the software. Um, concur is an example of that. And in cases like that, I think we see that can also, as we have up here, that can either be uh, profit generating, meaning that kind of that integration experience or the APIs themselves are meant to be a standalone product line, manages stuff as such, and not just generate top line revenue, but contribute to bottom line profit. Um, or they can be priced at a point where the goal is really to break even on the investment um, in APIs or in that integration experience. And then I think we see a number of others in sort of the bucket and this, you know, folks like a, um, like a Divi, like a micro strategy that, that we've seen lately where APIs and or integrations are part of the core product or the, the value proposition of their core product. Um, and that's really kind of, we see that they are trying to, or they are justifying those, uh, the investment in those APIs or that integration experience um, indirectly. And by that, we mean with increased competitive wins, um, reduced churn, perhaps, um, or just new, you know, opening up a new kind of tangential markets by integrating into a new or different application ecosystem. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, a business, maybe not a business model, but another model we see is, um, I think, um, there are companies that see APIs as being part of their infrastructure, um, and not 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 a a model as such. It's um, you know think of sort of public. We do quite a lot in the open data space, and if you think of public transport companies, you know run, building the the tracks to run the trains and providing an API that allows um, you know other services to integrate with them is part of that, um, just part of their business model. And um, and I suppose, but I mean, fortunately, these things are being sort of mandated by often at a government level of saying that that these sort of API services just have to be made available. So they don't doesn't really fit into that business model, but um, but quite relevant as well. Yeah, well, that's interesting. It's kind of you know, API as a public good that you know that feels like it deserves to be a fourth category as as government moves more towards open data, um, and and moves more into a digital age. Frankly, that. That I think that's a really relevant comment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's, uh, Brian, maybe shift into what did we see from the uh, the study in terms of what are the what are the benefits that uh, um, enterprises are uh, looking to achieve from their investment in APIs? Yeah, I think we can be briefer here. You know, the data are right in front of us on this one, and we asked this question to understand really the benefits realized. Um, and first and foremost, as you see, respondents said productivity, second, innovation. Uh, and third, uh, is that direct increase, um, direct increase in revenue. And in my mind, I think that this is a really valuable response, less from um, just understanding kind of the state of the world, but definitely as well from how do you think about justifying new projects going forward? Yeah, and do we see a shift as we look forward to the next 12 months, right? Um, you were talking about earlier, Brian, about the, the emphasis will move to more tactical 
projects, right? As the economies, uh, world economies slow down. What are, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, you know, we have a colleague of ours in the office actually mentioned that uh, her husband works um, in wholesale annuities. And this is a, an industry where they, for many years, have had a policy where they need wet signatures, you know, ink signatures on paper for all transactions. Of course, social distancing has forced them, I think, to to jump into the world of electronic signatures for better or worse. And I, I do wonder if you look at that productivity piece, kind of the biggest benefit folks have realized so far, you know, for a company like that, if they can deliver the integrations that make the new process kind of seamless, will they realize enough productivity gains um, just here, you know, whether it's months, hopefully not longer that, that we're kind of in this social distancing and, and lockdown world, they might see enough productivity gains that they decide to make that shift for good, even when I'll say life goes, quote, back to normal. Yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, there, you know, there's always a split. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, we see some of the other CEOs that I'm talking to, uh, certainly at the moment, um, productivity, automation, the tactical initiatives are uh, coming front and center and some of these strategic initiatives, right, the increased innovation, uh, moving a bit to the back burner. But um, I think as we move out of this, we'll also see innovation really accelerating, right, as, as trends of how people do business uh, dramatically. Well, let's um, let's now to... Uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, the, the respondents in our report really evenly split between uh, representing enterprises and software companies. And, and so there are, you know, some interesting uh, observations and uh, contrast between these uh, digitally native companies and, uh, and enterprises. And Ross, why don't you uh, share some thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the first things here is um, from a data perspective, we quite deliberately decided this year to ask slightly different questions depending on whether um, you uh, stated up front that you were more of a digital native software company versus uh, an enterprise. Um, and the fact that those two worlds perhaps have quite different um, stories to tell and quite different problems to solve. For example, um, a modern software company doesn't think of themselves as needing to um, do any sort of digital transformation. Um, so we asked slightly different questions, and those of you that filled out the survey um, will have seen different things uh, based on, on your responses up front. I think ultimately, you know, the, there's quite um, fundamental uh, considerations happening in both camps. And if we look at the next slide, we'll see that, you know, in the world of enterprise, um, the, the, the sheer explosion of applications that we've talked about a whole lot before is, uh, is really forcing IT leaders to think differently, um, that they um, need to um, reevaluate and critically reevaluate the um, integration choices they've made in the past and the, um, look at the software products that they're using to help share and synchronize data between the apps that their business relies on. So if, if we you know, think that in the past, and not that far in the past that we may have had, you know, somewhere between um, five and uh, 15, say, um, applications running our business. Um, reports suggest that most um, evolved um, enterprise orgs now um, lean on more than 1,500. So the way you approach that problem simply has to change. And I think that shows through in some of the commentary in the report. And I encourage people to go and look and understand some of the, the themes that we're talking about there. Um, the same is also true, though, um, on the flip side, right? The application providers themselves. Um, that in the past, it was it was enough for your app to just be um, highly functional and um, deliver a lot of value on its own. Um, but that's not really true anymore. One of the first questions um, any buyer will ask is, "Well, how does your product?" Um, um, integrate seamlessly with the other things that I use today. For example, if I'm buying a new expense management platform, I need to know um, that it's going to work seamlessly with the accounting um, and ERP infrastructure that I use in my business already. Um, and, and so um, really thinking about uh, how you're offering pre-built integration experiences to customers has really been quite fundamental. And I think there's then also a little bit of crossover here, right? Because 
Um, the example I'm showing um, on the, the right-hand side is actually Western Union and a new digital product um, from them. And, and so you can think of um, legacy businesses um, starting to solve some of those legacy processes with new digital, pro digital products. Um, and uh, this is actually a perfect example, going back to what I said at the very beginning, that uh, handling um, AR and AP uh, in, a, in a digital form is, is really something that will help um, businesses execute faster and more efficiently. Yeah, and that, it's interesting that trend of uh, not only for software companies, but like you mentioned, even that Western Union example of um, be becoming the table stakes, right, that you have to integrate into the applications used by customers and partners to, uh, to gain adoption of your product and even sell it. So that was a great perspective, Ross, thanks. Um, well, let's shift now into uh, really the next uh, phase of our webinar. And, and uh, we, we've talked about a lot of the data regarding the report, but um, a number of key topics came, were raised in the report. And we wanna provide further guidance that can really help on your API design strategy going forward. And um, one of those key areas is standards and standards is always a hot topic in the in industry and a, a um, interest and demand for uh, for more standards but I think it's interesting Ross this uh, this interest in data standards and uh, what, what did we see here yeah you know this is something kind of a continuation perhaps from what we saw in in last year's report and started to lay some of this groundwork when we asked quite simply, um, would you uh, appreciate um, the industry adopting more data standards? And um, we get a sort of overwhelming response um, that yes, that would help. And you know, I think when we consider the challenges that people have um, integrating um, applications and moving data around from one application to the next, um, uh, we don't make it as easy as it should be for folks. And um, so. Better standardization here um, is important. If you once you get a, get your hands on a copy of the report, and um, you'll see some of the examples I've I've given. But um, the one that I always use when I'm describing this problem um, is uh, schema.org, and uh, you will all have seen um, the results and the impact of schema.org in uh, your everyday life. If you make a flight reservation at some point in the future, you're not doing a whole lot of that right now, I'm sure. Um, your email client. Um, will uh, will um, respond to that and and highlight the fact that that's a flight reservation and perhaps alert you to things about that reservation um, in the future. And it's not the clever stuff from um, Gmail or Outlook that's um, helping um, uh, highlight those things. It's the metadata, the consistent data um, standardization inside that email that comes from United or Lufthansa or uh, or Singapore Airlines. The, the data inside the email itself, because it's a common um, standard, your email client can be uh, uh, told to look out for that and understand it. And we need more of that in order to, to create this lingua franca um, for applications as they, as they interact. Um, I think though, you know, sort of the tongue in cheek um, perspective on the next slide, you know, we're not saying that uh, that more standards are a good thing. What we really are looking for here is is consistency, um, and uh, and I think that that that's um, that, that's what helps us, um, you know, with interoperability and time to market and and ultimately easing the the pain and burden that really sits amongst um, developers that are building these integrations today. Matt, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I've I just sort of, it was making me think that the, um, you know, I, I think you've obviously got the open data initiative and um, and, and here in the UK you have the ODI as well, actually, um, and um, which is another <laughs> open data institute. Um, and, but you kind of look at the standards uh, and obviously there's cartoons and jest, but but what what drives standardization often, I think is, is you have to, you need, someone who's commercially or a group of companies who are commercially motivated to make that happen and, and, and become a universal standard um and that's that's obviously the problem with you know merging new standards well you you haven't got alignment between a bunch of parties that are that all commercially benefit from that um and you know gtfs is a good example google 
created GTFS really because they needed to show transit information on Google Maps. Um, not you could argue not for the greater good, but for their own need. Um, and that proliferated, you know, across the world. But I mean, today, you know, here in the UK, we we don't use GTFS as our standard, and I, I can't imagine um, much traction moving towards GTFS because we have a standard, and and that's um, and that's that's quite hard to displace those things. Um, but you know, so similar things are happening in the even in the async API world. I mean, in the event driven world, async API is a, is, a, is a new standard based on like open API. Um, and so that's that's even you know that's emerging and getting quite a lot of traction now, um, and helping to define how you can expose event driven APIs and exchange data. So there is you know it, it's good things are moving forwards, but um, uh, it, it's a slow game and and possibly this current climate will again force people's hands to to come together to make these things happen more quickly. Well, that's a uh, great segue, Matt, into. Uh this this world of event-based integration right one of the things that uh is becoming one of the most popular use cases for apis is to as we talked about right digital transformation and connecting end-to-end -end process flows together seamlessly, and uh, being able to uh, uh design apis that can uh, uh work effectively in this uh event-based world is uh is critical so what uh what are some of your thoughts on that um, well, I mean, you know, it's obviously interesting that the, the, the sort of what's on the top of developers' minds or businesses' minds is, is event-driven data integration. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's irrefutable that, that organizations and engineering teams are starting to um, design around event-driven architectures. Um, and, you know, obviously things like Kafka and Confluence are, are sort of, you know, almost becoming the standard in terms of how internally people process event-driven data. Um, but but when it comes to event driven APIs, maybe maybe it's, maybe I should just quickly sort of explain you know how an event driven API differs from traditional traditional APIs and, and why it's not quite as simple as um, you know why this is a problem event driven API. So you know a traditional API, um, you know going back to the early 2000s when APIs exploded and the API economy really sort of took pace. Um, what happened was the industry standardized around how um, a request and response, um, you know, request response type um, operation happened. And it was done over ACTP. And most people kind of adopted, started to adopt uh, REST and, and really sort of standardized around JSON. And although there's still some XML out there, but that was kind of, that made it easy because you could send a request and get a response um, and you knew how to do that. And there was no conversation around um, how you would do your API integration. You just knew that you would expose an API and that was the end of the conversation. Um, and in the, and sort of in the, in the event driven API world, it's quite a different problem because the, you know, the, the onus is on this. So if you're the publisher of an API, it's, it's your responsibility to push data as it happens. So as you know, if, a, um, if, if a, you're a logistics transport company and you want to notify the retailer that they're, um, parcel has been delivered it's your responsibility to notify the retailer as it happens and that creates a new sort of set sort of set of technical challenges and I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone on this call is probably pretty familiar with webhooks which is probably the sort of 101 of event driven apis um but as you know as as the demand for event driven data increases the webhooks um become a um you can outgrow webhooks very quickly if you need things like ordered data or very high volumes of data and so um what, what's happening is, you know, people start to look at, you know, organizations are starting to look at things like SSE as a, as a protocol or WebSub. Um, they're adopting platforms like Kafka, AMQP, RabbitMQ, and all of these services. But that's that's creating a lot of problems because um, unlike what we were talking about earlier in the early 2000s, where everyone knew how we would do event driven APIs, um, we actually got this huge fragmentation. And we're seeing probably 10, 15 different protocols being used for event driven um, API integration. That creates interoperability issues, um, and and it even gets more complex because it comes down to things like, if if you want a stream of live pricing information, do you want all of the prices or do you just want the latest price if there was a latency problem? Um, so there's there's quite a lot of complexity in event driven APIs, um, and and I think you know until event driven APIs is kind of invisible in the way that traditional APIs are today, that you know no one's even talking about what protocols you're using or how you're going to do that. Um, we're going to continue to see friction um, in terms of organizations adopting event driven integration. And I wouldn't be surprised if we this is still in the report um, as as a primary concern until you know until we sort of 
um, standardize around protocols. So, I mean, the Async API is an initiative um, that that kind of forked away from the Open API and 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 is rumored to be joining back into Open API. Um, but it's it's very much defining in the same way Open API defined APIs in a programmatic way that you can programmatically access APIs. Um, you know, the definitions of APIs. Async API is trying to do the same thing um, and making good inroads. And, and there's a lot of promise, really. Yeah, and Matt, you, you know, you mentioned earlier how Google's uh, weight behind uh, transit data um, helped to standardize that. Do you think the, we need a big player that can uh, move the industry in a direction uh, in this area? I... I'd like to think so, but um, again, I, it, it does. It, it's slightly more complicated than that because different protocols exhibit exhibit so different ways of solving a venture of an APIs um, better suit different requirements. So you know, at a simple level, trying to get data to a, a low energy device, MQTT is a good protocol for that because it's lightweight. Um, whereas if you need a high volume of ordered integral data between two systems. Something like Kafka is, you know, the protocols Kafka use is a good is a good protocol for that. So yes, um, we definitely need some muscle of the big players coming together and standardizing. Um, but I, I I don't see a future in the short term where, you know, we may go down from 15 protocols to three, but I can't see it going down to one, um, yeah. at least in the short term. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. So we're asked every year what's the most surprising or one of the, the most surprising results for the survey. And I think this is uh, fits in that category um, where customized APIs fit for a specific business need uh, leap to the top of the uh, top of the list, actually uh, move past uh, no code integration templates, which had been leading uh, our survey for the highest demand area. So uh, that's a quite surprising trend, right? Because we hear so much about no code, no code, but clearly code is still required and Ross what are your what are your observations about this yeah you know this does really continue to maybe not surprise me but I think it's an important thing for us to emphasize especially for API providers out there um, that businesses have kind of moved past this one size fits all approach and they're they're looking for ways to customize the APIs they expose and consume to fit a specific use case or application or business need in this case. So what we really mean here, and, and I think it's well understood by the respondents, is that um, there are kind of uh, in the examples Matt gave, there are different types of APIs, different best practices that can be applied depending on um, how and where you intend to consume that API. It's a concept um, that I think has been perhaps made most famous by our friends at Netflix. Um, and in maybe a, a, our report two or three years ago, um, we talked at some length about this and the idea of an API experience layer. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to see this continue to shine through at the top of the list. And yet, um, I don't see very many API providers out there um, doing anything to serve this demand. So um, it's something for us all to start considering um, uh, and, and prioritizing as we think about our API um, strategy going into 2020 and beyond. Yeah, thank you. All right, one last uh, topic as we uh, uh, before we move into uh, answering some of the questions that are coming in, and always an interesting topic, right? The uh, the interest level in uh, GraphQL uh, seems to continue to outstrip the uh, the adoption of uh, GraphQL and. Uh, so what are the, the thoughts of our panel on this topic? I think, you know, I could start and, and simply say that uh, we changed the questions around a little bit this year. We asked in the past about um, people's preference or interest in GraphQL, and that always ranks really highly. I think the hype here um, um, outstrips the actual uh, implementation um, for sure. Uh, so for many, GraphQL could be an interesting way to solve certain problems, um, but uh, it's by no means uh, going to, uh, in my opinion, it's not going to become the predominant um, API style um, for organizations going forward. Um, and, and I think there are some reasons for that, right? If we look at the, the next slide, you'll see that 
um, you know, there, there, are, there are obstacles. And from my point of view, I think um, tooling is, is one of the key things right now. Um, yes, if you'd have asked me a year ago, um, I'd have said uh, tooling was, you know, there was very little out there. Now, 12 plus months later from our last report, um, the, th there's definitely more. Um, but we're a long ways from the, um, the, the sort of adoption um, that other um, API styles and sort of, um, the purest uh, restful implementation um, um, that exists out there. Yeah, and, I, and I think I, I think Go one ahead. of the things. Uh, sorry, apologies. Um, I think one of the things that we see is you know GraphQL. We, we're still seeing it. It's it's the thing that's closest to the view layer. Um, and um, and that's where it's most powerful. So you know, I mean, obviously, it sort of came out of of the work that Facebook did to sort of solve the problems of lots of back and forth requests at the REST level um, to improve performance um, and also minimize the amount of data you send because it's only needed what's needed for the view. And I think that still is still where it's strongest, right? And th and there are cases in the sort of B two B space where you where you need that. Um, you know more more control over what data comes back, um, but but it it from our you know what we're seeing is it tends to sit closer to the view layers, um, and and that's why I, I agree with you. I think it's um it's it's uh, it's unlikely to displace APIs completely. It's just um it's 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 serving it's solving a problem that um, REST API traditional REST APIs didn't do so well at. Great. Well, thank you. We've covered a, a lot of ground here. Um, there's uh, much more detail on the report, which you can download from, from the URL. We've got a number of uh, questions that have come in, and I'm just going to move right into uh, into that. Use your chat, uh, the questions panel, uh, to submit your questions. Um, but yeah, one of the first ones, uh, you know, I'm surprised that you didn't cover anything on uh, gRPC. Uh, was that an emerging trend that uh, showed up in the report, Matt? Um, <laughs> yes, I, I, it's it's an interesting. I mean, you know, what we we're seeing adoption of gRPC, um, and but uh, the, the 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 problem with I mean, well, the gRPC solves solves kind of two problems at once, right? Um, you know, in terms of um, we're talking about data definitions, and so gRPC is you know strictly tight. Um, it solves some performance issues because it, it it's better suited because it's built on top of ACTB two. Um, and so it's definitely it's definitely gaining a lot of traction, um, but it's I'd still say predominantly used inside organizations, so within your network as opposed to interop you know between organizations. So I think it's I think what we will see is as organizations become more comfortable and dependent on GRPC internally, those same APIs will be exposed externally, and therefore GRPC will come to the front forefront. But um, I think the reason we're not seeing a lot about it right now in, in, in this sort of context is it's still primarily internal use. Great. Another um, another question, um, and we mentioned this at the beginning a bit, but uh, you know, another question on, have we had time to include trends and challenges and how the world has changed in the last month due to the global pandemic uh, and what considerations yeah. for the report? So, Maybe Brian, if you want to just uh, share a few more comments on uh, on this front. Yeah, I think you know. Unfortunately, no, we have not had a chance to say update the survey responses um, just because you know the world has been moving very quickly in the past few weeks in terms of the actual trends that we're seeing. But I think it would be really valuable to see and hear from you all. The respondents around the challenges. Um, so yeah, I'll do my shameless marketer plug here. That I think social media channels are kind of the best vehicle for this in real time. Maybe we'll be able to sort of compile those at some point in the future. Um, but there's, uh, you know, I think you can connect with us on the social channels. We're generally at Cloud Elements, but also um, there's a hashtag State of API Integration that you'll see some of the conversation from last year. But I think that um, is a really valuable tool in a time like this to for the community to surface the challenges you're facing in real time, as well as some of the solutions that, uh, like I said, maybe we'll be able to compile some of those later on. Great. Thanks, uh, Thanks, Brian. 
So in relation to data standards, does the open API specification go far enough? Uh, Ross? You know, I, I, I think in short, no, at least not in the context of, of uh, the way I'm thinking about data standardization. Um, we've participated actively in the open API initiative. Um, I've got lots of friends and, and uh, former colleagues that have been actively involved in involving those specifications and doing a fantastic job. So I won't um, poo-poo the efforts there at all. I just think that um, you know there's opportunity perhaps to do a little more. And one of the things that Matt mentioned that I think rings very true for me is um, that you know the there's benefits in uh, API documentation that's strongly typed. It's not enough to simply say this is a string. Um, I think we need to have a far greater um, uh, fidelity on how we document our APIs to enable better interoperability. JSON schema certainly helps in this regard. So I think that um, there's there's still there's a lot of good reason um, for, uh, for for you know the hows and whys um, the OAS uh, uh, certainly version three and beyond um, is is the right um, approach for API providers to follow. But I think we can continue to evolve it. Matt, any thoughts there? I think that encapsulates. I, mean, I think JSON schema, obviously being a separate specification, is. Um, I, I know there's a lot of, a lot of convergence as well with what Open API are doing. Um, uh, but I, I think that that is important. I think the problem there, I imagine, is that, um, you know, that that again assumes that every every API uses JSON, which is not necessarily the case. So I think gRPC. Um, we, we may have get some lessons from GRPC and the, and the strongly typed APIs um, that, that we can apply um, uh, back to things like the open API specification. But yes, I agree. I think the open API specification, not, not, not because they're not trying, but certainly just because it, you know, the state of where it is, it, it, it could go further in terms of defining data types. All right. Well, it looks like we have time for uh, one last question. Um, and this is always, this is an interesting topic. Uh, um like to hear more about hybrid cloud deployments for API management if possible. So uh, thoughts here. You know, I will happily jump in here and say that um, the we, we live in a world where um, flexibility, I think, is really key. Um, it's not reasonable to assume that everybody is comfortable with um, public cloud um, infrastructure. I think that that's certainly the future, but um, there's still a lot of organizations that have invested heavily on their, on their own uh, uh, computing infrastructure, and they're going to want to continue to use that for many years to come, potentially. Um, so I think there's uh, a, a need and, and definitely availability uh, of um, hybrid deployment options for, um, for API management and for um, for iPads, and uh, and and certainly, um, yeah, you should uh, like take a good look at the the market here and and get an understanding of of what it is you actually need and want, and and the reasons for those needs and wants. A lot of people have quite historical or outdated reasons for thinking about um, on-prem or other hybrid uh, deployment architectures, and, and we should evaluate whether those reasons are still true today. Security, for example, isn't necessarily a good one. There are, there's no inherent reasons why public cloud is less secure than something else. Yeah, Ross, I'll chime in as well. Just I, I don't have any stats or data, but I know I've seen um, from several of the industry analysts um, expectations that uh, given the state of the world, um, there would be a push to moving, there would be greater adoption and a push to adopt more or move more uh, data and applications to cloud infrastructure, just given the fact that it's hard to get into the offices for folks to, uh, to maintain anything that's truly sitting in the basement anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. Well, with that, um, for, I'd like to, first of all, thank all of you who uh, joined us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you to our panelists. Uh, 
Ross, Brian, and Matt. Uh, great job today and, and fantastic insights into the uh, state of uh, APIs. And um, again, we just wish you all uh, safety and health uh, during these times. So uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. It's a lot. Thank you. That's all.